Hi guys, very welcome to Mentor and yet another video podcast. As always, I hope you're doing absolutely fantastic. Today on the podcast, guys, we're going to be talking about aircraft noses. Why are the aircraft noses on modern aircraft kind of roundish? Why are they not pointy like on the Concorde? And why do the Boeing noses look different than the Airbus noses? So stay tuned. Right guys, this video is brought to you in cooperation with our new sponsor Skillshare. Now Skillshare is a website that will have thousands and thousands of courses in anything that you can imagine, anything that you want to improve or check out. Use the link below, I'll tell you a little bit more about them later on. Right guys, so why is it that modern airliners have these rounded noses? Okay. And why are they not pointy, like the ones that you see on the Concorde, for example, or on really f fast fighter jets or reconnaissance jets? Um, well, the reason for this actually has to do a lot of, with aerodynamics, as you might imagine. Um, when you go into aerodynamics and you look into what kind of drag is created during the subsonic region of flight, as in when you're flying slower than the speed of sound, you'll notice that the two biggest components of drag is skin drag, which is the actual friction of the air as it moves over a surface, and form drag, which is the actual, you know, if you look at the, the surface of the object that is moving through the air, how big that is, okay? Those two are the two major components in uh, subsonic flights. And if you look at a rounded nose, compared to a pointy nose, in order to make a pointy nose, you actually need much more material. It has to be much bigger, longer, and that means more skin drag. There's more surface of the air for the air to move over. So when NASA did, um, they get, they did experiments on this, which they of course did, um, they found out that that rounded nose form that you see on modern airliners today actually creates the lowest amount of drag during the subsonic uh, flight regime. So, and that then brings us obviously over to why we do see aircraft like the Concorde, for example, or like fighter jets with the pointy nose. Now, those aircrafts are flying the biggest part of their flight, their cruise regime, in the transonic or the supersonic area. And when you're talking about supersonic flight, there's a whole different kind of amount of drag that is involved. In subsonic flight, as in slower than sound, uh, when an object is moving through the air, there will be kind of a rumor spreading ahead of the object through the air molecules saying that there's something coming due to pressure effects, okay? So the air molecules already before the object is, is coming will have started to move out of the way of the object, okay? When you come in through the transonic area and into the supersonic area, as in quicker than the speed of sound, that rumor will not be there. Okay, the air molecules will be coming and suddenly the object will come and the air molecule will hit it bang on. Okay, that means that the air molecule, instead of moving softly away, will hit it and change direction very rapidly. Now, what that is called is a sonic wave. Okay, so there will be what's called wave drag. Now, you would have noticed or heard of this or seen this as the boom, the, the uh, sonic boom that happens when an aircraft moves through the sound barrier. That is the formation of this wave, okay? This wave creates an enormous amount of drag. It is much bigger, much more significant than the form drag and the skin drag, which means that aircraft that has to fly through the supersonic area needs to minimize this drag. And one way of doing that is having a very pointy nose, okay? Because of a pointy nose, if it's very pointy like this, the, the direction change of the air molecules will be less and since that's less, it also means that the actual effect of the wave is less. There are other features as well, aerodynamic features, like the, uh, the fact that we're using um, swept wings 
also has to do with the speed of sound because modern airliners, even the ones the 737 or the Airbus 320 then, that we're flying, uh, will move some parts of the aircraft will actually be in the transonic uh, speed regime. So there's a lot of this. And this, by the way, guys, is why I always keep telling you that you need to, you know, pay close attention during your physics lessons and your mathematics lessons. Because what I'm giving you now is just an oversight of some aerodynamic features. What you will have to do during your ATPL theory is dive into that. And there's a lot of formulas and a lot of mathematics involved in that. Just saying. All right. Okay, so that's the reason why you have the rounded nose on normal airliners and the pointed nose on uh, any kind of aircraft that's going to fly in the supersonic regime. Um, another reason, by the way, on top of this uh, is, of course, if you put pointed noses on aircraft, you're going to have a problem with visibility from the cockpit. The, uh, it's very famous in the case of the Concorde because the Concorde had to lower the nose down to a negative angle in order for the pilots to be able to shoot an approach. And also when it just comes to parking the aircraft, that long pointy nose is going to take up a lot of room. It's not going to be very practical. Um, another thing that we do, the reason that we have these rounded noses is because inside of the nose we tend to have the weather radar. The weather radar is actually moving or it's tilting a little bit depending on how we set it. So it needs quite a lot of room and the rounded nose is perfect for housing that. Um, but it doesn't really explain why there's a difference between the way a Boeing nose looks to how an Airbus nose looks. Now that has more to do with history and tradition than anything else. So Boeing is a much older company than Airbus is. So Boeing has been doing, has been making aircraft for a much longer time. And what you will notice is that the, the nose on the Boeing 727 even the 707 and the 737 are all very similar to each other. So Boeing has made these nose, made aircrafts, they have tested them in wind tunnels and they've noticed that this kind of nose actually works. Okay, it works well, it has good drag characteristics, things like that. And they've made a manufacturing uh, technique in order to build these ones. The factories are built to make these noses, the workers know how to do it, and crucially the engineers at Boeing knows how to make these noses. All right. So it's very very likely that for each new generation, um, since the engineers knew how to handle these noses and how to build cockpits inside of them, they just kept with whatever they had that was working. Now, in the case of Airbus, Airbus is a much newer company. So they had the benefit of actually trying out the most efficient form of a nose in uh, computer models, you know, and before they started with wind tunnel testing. So it is very likely that the noses that you see on an Airbus 320, for example, is slightly more aerodynamic than a 737 nose. But it is also very likely that the difference is so small that Boeing decided that rather than remaking factories or remaking the model the way that we do things we just stick to this because it's also a brand issue you will notice the uh, the nose of a boeing you will kind of instantly recognize a boeing nose and it actually at least in in my uh, thinking and most others as well it actually just looks a little bit better than the uh, than the very round nose of an airbus so now I don't have this is this is my own theories I think that this is the reason behind it so the airbus slightly more aerodynamic, boring, a little bit more of history involved. Okay. But what about the 787 nose then? That nose looks completely different than all the other Boeing um, noses ahead of it. Or does it? Now, I don't know if you've seen this before, but if you compare the shape of the nose of the uh, Boeing 787 to the very first jet airliner, the, the Haviland Comet, you will notice some really striking similarities in there. And the reason is that this nose is probably the most um, aerodynamic shape for an aircraft nose in that speed regime that exists. Okay. Now, the reason that the Boeing and the other aircraft manufacturers went away from it probably had to do with the fact that they needed to fit stuff like, for example, the weather radar inside of Radome. And also, it might not have been very economical or, or even 
um, when it comes to structural integrity, might have not have been great to build the nose that way. But now, since the engineers have access to things like carbon fiber and they have completely new manufacturing techniques, you see that old nose from the comet come back into the 787. And it's very likely that that's going to continue to be the look that we will see on new aircraft. And for those of you who've been wondering why did the nose is drooped, on the 787 why it's kind of pointing down it's for the same reason as i mentioned about the concorde you have to as the aircraft is coming in on final you're going to have a slight positive attitude on most modern bigger aircraft uh, in order for the pilots to be able to sit in the cockpit and have a good view outside and see the approach properly and also when we're taxiing around on the ground you don't need a big nose in front of you you want that to be a little bit out of the way and the only way really to do that is to either do like the Concorde and have something that actually folds down or have a nose that is slightly drooped down. So this is why the 787 looks like it does and this is why I think that you will probably see this type of nose coming on most of the Boeing aircraft going forward. Uh, but that's, that's noses for you and this is, this is why um, basically anything that has to do with the aviation has some kind of good explanation probably to do with aerodynamics like reducing drag and things inside of it. Keep asking these kind of questions. I love finding out about it. I love informing you guys about it. So uh, what I also wanted to tell you guys is I want you to check out Skillshare. Okay, as you know by now, the only ones, the only companies that I allow to sponsor this channel are companies that give you something, something that makes your life better and that teaches you something. Skillshare is a perfect example of this. Now, I personally use it to improve my Spanish. There's great Spanish courses inside of there, but even if you want to know how to make pottery or you want to learn how to do great photography or a course that I think that you guys would probably like is a course involving a real flight instructor who's using flight sim in order to give a PPL course from the beginning to the end, all the things to think about, all of that is available inside of Skillshare. Okay, so what I'd like you to do is just use the link here below. The 500 first of you guys who click this link will get two months completely for free so you can check it out without having to commit to anything and I'm sure that you will find something in there something that you've always wanted to kind of get better at and you will find a course for that inside of Skillshare have an absolutely fantastic day wherever you are out there keep sending in your questions keep interacting inside of the mentor aviation app by the way it's great to see the community building up in there it's great to be able to be in there myself to help out to answer questions and i know there are other pilots who's doing exactly the same take care of yourselves have a great day and see you next time bye bye